Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in a typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and we're doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from the cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you are looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow or slide into our DMs. We often talk about all things modern on our show. Modern love, modern sex, modern relationships. However, today we decided to switch things up and go back in time. We have invited the incredible Dr. Kate Lister onto our show to give us a history lesson on sex workers, non-monogamy, and all things sex. Dr. Kate Lister is a lecturer at the School of Arts and Communication at Leeds Trinity University. She primarily researches the literary history of sex work and curates the online research project Whores of Yore, an interdisciplinary digital archive for the study of historical sexuality. Kate has also published in the Medical Humanities, Material Culture, Victorian Studies, and Neo Medievalism. She regularly writes about the history of sexuality for iNews, Vice, and the Wellcome Trust, and won the Sexual Freedom Publicist of the Year Award in 2017. We can't wait to get into it. So today we're also going to start with a somatic inquiry, and this inquiry is actually inspired by our guest today. And it's something I became conscious of while reading her brilliant book, A Curious History of Sex. And it's how certain words make us feel. We all have certain feelings when it comes to the language and the words that we use and the choices we make when it comes to language. We see it often as somatic sex educators that people have very particular language that they want to use, sometimes for their genitals and sometimes during sexual situations. There's words that will turn people off on and there's words that will turn people off. And, you know, some words will feel icky to people. Kate has an amazing chapter in her book about reclaiming of the word cunt, which is a word I know many North Americans squirm at the mention of. So my somatic inquiry today is that I will read off a list of words and I want you to notice how each word makes you feel in your body whether there's any movement your body wants to make when you hear the word, whether there's a scrunching up of your face or rolling your eyes or a little smile or maybe shaking your head. Notice what the word feels like as it washes over you. And then if you'd like to take it a step further, imagine what this word would look like if it could walk, right? If it had an embodied shape, maybe feel free to make that shape or do that walk or that movement yourself. So content and trigger warning, some of these words are adult in nature, like most of our show. Some of them may be a little too much for you. If you want to skip forward and not hear them, that's totally okay. So let's start with a word that I know a lot of people have feelings about, the word moist. Moist. What does the word moist feel like as you hear it, as you mouth it with your own mouth? What would moist look like if you could act it out? The next word is pussy. Notice the sensations, even if they're ever so slight, at the sound of the word pussy. Where in your body do you feel it register? What does your face and your facial expression have to say about the word pussy? Does it feel different if I whisper it like this? Pussy. Or if I say it harshly like this? Pussy. How does the word pussy walk? And next, my favorite, the word cunt. Try saying it yourself and see what it feels like to say the word. What thoughts, feelings, or sensations happen in you when you hear or say the word cunt? How does the word cunt walk around in this world? Now let's try the same with the word cock. And now let's also examine the word whore. What is your relationship to that word? What do you feel when you hear the word whore? 
What did you notice about this exploration of how words feel in your body? Did anything surprise you? Maybe try it with other words in your own time. But now, going from, from that last word, the word whore, and that sounds really bad, actually. But I was going to say going from the word whore to the very incredible brain behind whores of your Dr. Kate Lister. Um, Kate, is there anything important that we missed in our intro that you'd like to share? No, I don't think so. That was a hell of an intro, wasn't it? That was, I very much appreciated that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, do you, did you have any specific thoughts on any of those words as we on the as words? I was yeah, I was, um, I hate the word moist and I don't know why, just as you were talking about it then. I, and I know a lot of people do and I have no idea why people don't like it. Like, it's weird. Like, why of all the words would it be that word? And I don't know what it is. I think if I had to try and guess, I think that it's a very particular type of fear that's called abjection, which is a visceral reaction that you get to something because it's related to the body, but it's a body where it's not supposed to be. Like, there's things like, like everyone, hold on to your stomach, but things like blood and pus and puke and excrement will make us react in a way that nothing else will. It's that, oh, God, it's horrible, get away. That one, that, oh in a way that nothing else will, even the sight of it will freak us out to that point. And that fear is called object or abjection. And the theory is, is because we, we're we familiar with all of these things. Like we know what blood is. We're supposed to have blood. Blood's a good thing. Blood's, please, we should definitely have that. But if we see it somewhere it's not supposed to be, then it freaks us out, like reminds us of death. And I think that maybe moist is along those lines because it makes us think of moist things, of moist bodies when perhaps they're not supposed to be and I don't know that's just my hunch of what that word is I'm sure other people have their own theories but yeah I don't like that word no. I don't know why no it's I don't know icky, why it's an icky word for me too icky Tara, word you... yeah yeah <laughs> Tara do you like the word moist it doesn't bother me for me I kind of relate it to more texture and sometimes I don't like like moist textures so it's it's iffy it depends on the way that it's used. But if it's just like moist, I'm like, mm. If it's on the Great British Bake Off, it's all right. If it's in relation to something else, no. It's a little bit like ooh, when someone describes a cake as moist. But like, if someone said that they need moist soil or moist compost, I wouldn't bat an eyelid. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, it's it's a weird one. And when you said um, pussy, um, I felt a slight sense of embarrassment. And I don't know why. It's a really interesting word, that one. And I think it's because... You can almost get away with using it in a non-sexual context, like when you're talking to your mates or like if you're talking, you could perhaps use it when you're talking to a doctor. But there's always just that faint sense of like, should I use this word? Is this a bit, is it weird? Because it's quite a sexual word, isn't it? And again, it isn't, when it it's, isn't. it isn't, it isn't. I mean, it's it's enough that you probably wouldn't say it to the doctor, there's something wrong with my pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it was like a cool female doctor I might definitely not with a male doctor no. No, but it's I don't know it's just the thing with all these words is they're very context dependent aren't they yeah. very like pussy is a great word when you're with a lover and you're feeling a bit naughty but then when you try and take out a context and like like you don't you don't use it with children for fuck's sake then that would be really weird <laughs> or like when you use it with some friends or I don't know it's just so yeah I felt a faint sense of embarrassment rising so I'm never sure how that word should be deployed because it's like a really dirty word that sort of masquerades as a a regular word right yeah I mean I I don't like it because because it's what people historically or always have called weak men oh you're such a true and then then I think I really don't want to call a really powerful part of my body after a weak man why would I want to do that Mm-hmm. I like it... the word cunt because it feels powerful and it feels like, yes, she has power and she, that she's she's strong. And I'm not going to call her a pussy because that's that that sounds pathetic to me. That's it's strange, isn't it? The way that works. Does, does it help to know that pussy probably comes from the Norse word for a purse? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, it does. I mean, now it's been appropriated to mean like a weak a weak person and we know why that is don't we because as you said the vagina and vulva have been coded as weak and 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 not as strong as the mass as, as the man 
for as long as time we can remember, which is nonsense, by the way. Penises are incredibly fragile. You have to flick those things and they just fall <laughs> around screaming. This is true. <laughs> yep. Yes. And, you know, obviously everyone should go and read that chapter in, in your book on the word cunt. That was my, oh, my favourite. Yeah. I think I got banned from Instagram a couple of times, though, for putting <laughs> hashtag team cunts on things. So, you know, re- read the chapter and then perhaps don't use the hashtag publicly because you'll get your Instagram banned. <laughs> it's um, it's it, that, The word now makes me really happy. It, I think I've had quite a strong desensitising process to it, having written about it and spoken about it. And I've now said cunt in front of numerous audiences and people that you probably shouldn't say that word to and they just don't even bat an eyelid. And so it makes me very happy now to the point where I can often forget that other people don't experience it that way. And I'm I'm in danger of desensitizing it to myself so much that I would say to a doctor, I need some <laughs> cunt cream. <laughs> the alliteration of that just works better as well. Beautiful, isn't it? Cream. Yeah. 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 But again, I don't know, I I think I love the way that, that word can be so, it's got so many different meanings behind it. Not, I mean, generally the meaning is the same, but again, it's that really context specific thing. Like it, you're in North America and whoa, it's the impact of it there is so much different than it is in the UK. But then again, like, you know, my friends will call me a daft cunt with absolute regularity and a shred of embarrassment. And it's very funny. But if my boss called me a cunt, there'd be a disciplinary hearing. Right. You know, mm-hmm. like it's I think it's really funny when you see either little old ladies or very small children swearing. That always makes me laugh. And videos of especially Glaswegian elderly ladies calling people wee cunts. I just it's just <laughs> magical. And I love <laughs> Or a daft uh, cunt or a soft cunt is is, a, but it's just such a great word. It's and, and the sound and shape of it as well. Have you ever tried calling an American a daft cunt and see? What I happens? I, ha- I can get away with it a little bit because I I can play the British card quite strongly. But I have used it around Americans before, and I do see the impact of like, oh yes, that's right. They that's it's quite a big deal in America still. Whereas in Scotland, couldn't give a shit. Right. Ireland as well. Australia, they're pretty defty, deft-handed with a cunt as well. And America's getting better. I've seen it creeping into films. Mm-hmm. I've seen I've seen the use of it slight to increase, or at least it's I've seen people playing with it a bit more because it's like this napalm word that you've got in the back of your pocket that you can just. I love that about it. It's like it's the it's the one that we you can, the final one that you can go to and for a real shock value. It is. It's a very powerful word. Mm. It is, and and it's such. And when you look at it's, it's fascinating to look at how it's used, why people react in the way that they do to it. But really, like when you try and peel it back a little bit, is well, what are we saying about that? Because we know what cunt means. It means vulva, but. The fact that that word can cause that much offence, are we saying vulvas are offensive? Because that's what's implied, isn't it? There is no penis equivalent. There's no napalm penis word that makes everyone freak out. In fact, most of the words for penis are are much more versatile than the words for vulvas. Because you could talk to a doctor about your dick or your cock or, you know, you'd be getting sort of like silly slang territory like pork sword before it started to get a bit... (laughs) (laughs) but um but yeah it's this idea of like well what are we saying with that word is a vulva the most offensive thing on the planet it's a strange one isn't it Hmm. interesting it is a great question of deep wonder right and it's a really old word too it's one of the words that it's so old that eventually etymologists go fuck knows that's how old it really? is. They, yeah, it's so old. Like you can trace pussy back to a certain date and and vagina. Vagina is actually a far more offensive word. Vagina is taken directly from Latin and it means a sheath. It's something that a sword goes into. Oh. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> and so it's that's its entire etymological function is the holder of a sword. And obviously we don't need a very vivid imagination to know what that sword is. Whereas cunt is, it's ancient, it's it's such an old word. We're not even sure what its meaning is, but it's thought that it also gave us the word cunning, which also which means wisdom 
it didn't mean like a sneaky a sneaky person so it's it's roots are in wisdom and probably female as well the coo sound gives his queen which is far more empowering than vagina isn't it absolutely yeah and it refers to the whole like you said the whole yep. vulva, not just you know like the vaginal canal which again people use the word vagina to denote that the whole you know to denote everything all the time which is just wrong and, so, and then you get lots of passive aggressive people on on social media going, uh, I think you mean actually the vulva, or I mean the vagina, vagina canal. And it's kind, of, we have like all these little differential points between it, but we all kind of know what we mean. Exactly, exactly. So we, yeah. I know what I mean. You know what you mean, and that's kind of the nice thing about cunt, I suppose. Is it? it but then you know, so does pussy. Pussy means the whole thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's not specific, yeah. sort of. No, abstract. No, but yeah, I love that word. It makes me happy when I hear it. Yay. <laughs> oh. So Kate, what led to your interest in history and the history of sex in particular? Oh, wow. There's a question. So I've always been fascinated by history. Even as a small child, I, I remember sneaking into the school library and trying to find books about history. And there was one about the Roman Empire and it was had lo- loads of pictures in it. And I just, I must have been about five or six I just endlessly fascinated with it I just wanted to know more and more like why were these people dressed in this weird way and and what were they doing and what were their religion why did they think that and all so I think it started there of just this real like just of how strange it all was and I just I wanted to know where how people lived their lives and one of the things that I loved best as a kid was going to visit castles which you can do a lot in the UK because we've got a fair few castles knocking about and I loved that I'm just imagining who lived there so it's always been a real passion of mine and then as I got older and older it became a, a sort of an academic interest I suppose and why sex <laughs> I think probably because I've been equally as fascinated by sex it's just it's just a fascinating subject for me I think what I like about the history of sex is that it's it's one of the few subjects that I think everybody can have an opinion on. There's, there's not many things that unite all human experiences and I know that the asexuals are out there going Ooh, what but like even they have a sexuality and it's something you know like eating sleeping dying shitting these are things that every human being has experienced throughout history and mm-hmm. that is something that I think is really profound because it gives you an understanding of the history in a way that other things don't so yeah, so history, the fact that the act itself has remained pretty consistent, there's nothing much new there. Um, if you rub these things like this, this will happen. <laughs> and that's, 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 but we seem endlessly fascinated with it. Like, we, there's nothing, we haven't thought up new sex things since we first started having sex, and yet we're still endlessly fascinated with it. So I think that's what interests me, is that it's this constant, we need to have sex, we need to be having types of sex and it's also something that we all have in common with each other which makes it a real leveler of human experience I think it's something you've got in con- in common with Henry VIII or Mother Teresa or Queen Cleopatra or any of those people yeah we know Mother, it's like Mother Teresa crush. I'm going to say Mother Teresa <laughs> she had a sexuality we all <laughs> even if her sexuality was was saying that she's not going to indulge it because she's a woman of faith all of desires we know what it's like to fancy somebody that's true you know that's yeah i'm not for one second outing mother Teresa, as you know (laughs) i thought you had information we didn't have kate i was like (laughs) give me the scoop on mother Teresa." (laughs) well there's a lot of stuff going on there that's not sex related there's a few documentaries floating around she might not have been all that good but mother Teresa aside yeah that's what interests me about sex is it's it's an ancient history because it has to be as old as we are but also it's very modern and very present because we're still all in a tangle about sex. We still haven't figured it out. Mm-hmm. We're still hung up about it and have real anxieties around it. Yeah, that's I think that, that's what attracted me to it. Or maybe I'm just a massive pervert and wanted an excuse. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> You're in good company for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love that. You really like found your your calling then. The niche. I, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. I love history too. And that's like my go-to for books or movies. Right. I'm like, I need a history one. Like I'm outlander obsessed right now. So Oh, that is good, isn't it? That I do like that show. I haven't watched the latest series of it though, so I'm definitely due 
a catch up. But like we're we're all history buffs to a certain extent. We love a good period drama and we love this idea of how things were in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely there with you. It's just inexhaustible curiosity for me. Always has been. I imagine a lot of people in your life had an opinion about your passion for academic sex research. <laughs> pa- parents, yes. friends, teachers. Um, what was that like? My my family have always been super supportive. They have. I mean, like sometimes, like I remember when Curious History first came out, and there was a shitty article that was written about it in the Times, and they'd interviewed me for it, and for some reason they went with the headline how's your father he's squirming about my sex book which was like really shit for so so many reasons now i do know that the person who chooses the headline isn't the person who wrote the article it's it's a random copy editor but i was still fuming i was like first of all my dad is not squirming at all he's super supportive and proud of me and regularly gives my book out to his mates which is hysterical Amazing. And also at the time, I was a 38 year old university lecturer and doctor of history. Don't you be worrying about what my dad thinks, you fucking morons. So, but um, for some reason, people do want to bring your family into it a lot. And I think it, and I don't think they'd do it if it was a man, this idea of like, oh God, what, what does your parents, what does your dad think? They are super, super, super supportive, but they've always been quite open with us. Like we grew up in a naked house, you know, the house where your parents just wander around. Same, naked. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <same. laughs> Till about teenage years, and then then it starts. Then no, we're not doing that anymore. Right? Okay. And they were quite open about talking about sex and and things like that. So they and there's an ongoing joke, obviously, about what's Kate doing now, what's Auntie Kate up to now. My brother likes to make jokes about it. He's very funny. He makes me laugh. He'll like I'll put links to articles written or stuff that I'm doing and. And he'll put stuff in the family group chat of like, really, this has gone on long enough. Is anybody going to restrain her? <laughs> um, she's bringing shame to the family and things like that. <laughs> they're they're lovely. They're but it's it's a weird one. You know, I don't know if you've experienced this with your families and when you study sex. Is eventually everyone becomes slightly desensitized to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually and then uh, my mum regularly describes how she'll be talking to her mates in like a, a little craft group that she likes to do and she'll be halfway through telling them what my latest podcast or article is about before she realizes she has to say the word blowjob to a room full of events <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how to finish this sentence so yeah they're all kind of pretty pretty blase about it now work have been interesting because they're um I work for a university who are very supportive and very lovely and very liberal, but really don't want to talk about it that much. So if I could just do it and be quiet about it, that's fine. That yeah, be, suit them. be quiet about your best-selling yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Be just, very quiet about it. Yeah, it's it's just it's funny when we kind of bump into it just occasionally. They are my, The people that I work with, they're absolutely amazing and lovely. It's when you get a bit further up to sort of management level and it's just like, do you really have to be right about blowjobs this much? <laughs> can you write about, can you write about curing cancer or something but by by they're they're lovely um so yes yeah, so I'm really lucky that I get I get loads and and loads of support around it yeah which is nice yeah, yeah absolutely that would make it mm, not like not just easier but also like encouraging to keep yeah. doing what you're doing yeah, they're um and you know, my mum is my biggest fan, I think. She listens to every mm. episode of the podcast and then sends me text messages afterwards to critique it and, and... <laughs> Yeah. Hey. I, yeah, she's <laughs> she's a sweetie. She's um she's an absolute sweetheart. But no, they're they're rooting for me the whole time. They're lovely. And my friends just think it's hilarious. The ones that do seem to have trouble is that when you date people, I don't know if you guys find this as is yeah. people that do sex for a living, but it really complicates your interactions with 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 other humans who mm-hmm. don't who haven't known you for a very long time like I don't know quite know what they're expecting but when I when I meet people of like I try and go on a date or I meet people for the first time it's like sex is it because of what I do and what I write about sex is now suddenly part of the conversation in a way that it wouldn't be and it, it people want to and they probably shouldn't, but like they suddenly think that it's okay to talk to you about quite graphic things, and and that's like a weird process, isn't it? It's I'm not quite sure what to do with that. Or I find that that people people want to have sex with me because I wrote a book on sex. Right. Yeah. 
that's which is because you must want it all the time i must want it all the time i must want it because i research sex i talk about sex and i tweet about sex i must want them to have sex with me that makes perfect sense or assumptions um, of like being good at sex yes like like you really want to yeah Yeah. like you're some kind of sexual yoda or something (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it's true i I've, I've experienced that sylvie have you oh yeah and uh, you know you're just talking about your mom earlier i mean my my mom as well you know a somatic sex educator and in the beginning she didn't quite understand what that was and now i get whatsapp texts at two o'clock in the morning from my mom who's who's in cardiff and and she's like claire down the road husband is having premature ejaculation and i'm like <laughs> ew why why do i need to know about claire down the road's husband oh, and she's it. like and she's like, will you talk to her? And I'm like, will she pay for a session? Because otherwise, no, mom. Like, I'm not going to talk to Claire from down the road about her husband's premature ejaculation. But oh, or she'll send me articles brilliant. in the Daily Mail and be like, look, Sylvie, this woman does exactly what you do. And then it's like, you know, it's some random, like, I'm like, no, that, like, yep. you should let me one with some woman who watches couples have sex and then critiques them afterwards. And my mom was like, look, she does your job. And I'm like, no, she, no, she doesn't. <laughs> I don't know um, what job that is. <laughs> What's that? And my mom was like, you should talk to the Daily Mail. And I'm like, I will never talk to the Daily Mail. I will never. Don't but thanks, mom. Don't don't <laughs> no. But um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a weird one. Anything to do with sex because, because we're still very uncomfortable about it and people don't know how to react to it if you you probably do exactly the same thing as me when you meet people for the first time hello what do you do exactly yeah right what am I going to do and you're kind of weighing up the situation of like right how much am I gonna right do? so I usually go with I'm a historian but I'm like always a historian of what and then it's kind of like and then you say, do I do I say I'm a sex historian because now we're on a whole different trajectory or do I just just lie and say I'm a history historian of the 19th century or something like that because it it does change how people relate to you sometimes they make a joke of it sometimes they overshare sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes it just bounces right off them and they just absolutely don't give a shit and those, those people are absolutely lovely but it because and it's not that the people you're talking to are nasty not at all most of the time it's that it's that not a, it's just not a subject that we are comfortable with at large so it provokes reactions in people mm-hmm. it's like you've just run into a room and gone penis and everyone says the fuck what? It's was oh. just over here doing <laughs> this thing. And now there's this mad woman and you just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. And there's all these assumptions about what you must be like as well. You know, like people think you must be fabulous in bed. I'm like, I am fabulous in bed, obviously. Obviously. But you mustn't just assume that. <laughs> <laughs> Try before you buy. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do worry about that sometimes. After I've had sex with people, I'm just like, Ugh. Was it was it what you thought it would be? Just... <laughs> uh, and it makes dating you. a nightmare because like it's been a few times. I mean, once in a while, I'll have a moment of pure insanity and I'll download dating apps again. And then usually within an hour, I've gone, yeah, that's that's why I don't like dating apps. But what tends to happen is when I start talking to someone, obviously they Google who you are. I Google who they are, and then a lot of the time they'll just unmatch me. Because they they think that maybe I'm there just posing as someone on Tinder because I, I want to write an article about mm. them or or maybe it's like it just is it's just too weird for people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? it yeah, maybe is. I should have just just researched ancient Roman pottery kilns or something. Then I wouldn't have any of this. <laughs> no, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, I'll keep researching sex. And to be fair, on Roman pottery kilns, there's quite a lot of sex, so, you know... There's loads of sex, you can't get away from it. There's The the Romans just put sex on everything, didn't they? Now, they were a culture that was... If you told them I'm a sex historian, they'd be like, is there any other type of historian? (laughs) It wouldn't wouldn't have even blinked. Exactly. I, so I know you're, you're currently striking at the moment to help raise awareness of the pay yeah. gap in universities. Tell us a little bit about what's yeah. going on there. Oh, man. I mean, it's going to get to the point in the UK where it's going to be easier for just the people who aren't on strike if they could just all put their hands up and just let us know <laughs> who you are. Because um, the junior doctors have just voted to go out on strike. The nurses are going to be out on strike. Um, train operators, the postal service um lawyers i think have been on strike for a while actually intermittently school teachers have voted to go out as well 
uh, and a whole heap of others and university lecturers are uh, another group of them so there's it's one of those ones where it's, like, it's not one thing it's not just the gender pay gap although that is shit that that exists at all and in higher education it's on average 16 percent difference between wow. men and women That's doing the huge. same job yeah i know and it's really shit and then and then whenever you post anything about us online there's always some little fucking who turns right. up to try and tell you that that you're wrong and that there's no such thing as the gender pay gap and and they normally come in different forms there's either someone who just goes no i saw jordan peterson him or there's ones that try and like goad you a bit of, bit of being like really i thought that that was illegal <laughs> and all that stuff well it is illegal to pay different people differently for the same work but in many professions i'm sure that you've worked in a couple yourself they have pay bands spans so uh, the starting rate for a university lecturer is twenty five thousand pounds um up to thirty five thousand. and so it's what will happen is that the men are, are normally at the, the higher end of that so that's one of the reasons that they're on strike because it's just shit that shouldn't be happening uh pay is another one obviously perennial there hasn't been a pay rise in higher education for at least the last 10 years which means that there has been a drop in real term uh pay for 19 in 19 percent which is a lot isn't it and i know that i always feel very conscious of the fact that university lecturers they're not on the bread line you know so right. there's a certain thing of like maybe there's there's an idea that oh you're just overly pampered and, da, 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 and what you worrying about and some people would love that wage but to have not had a pay rise in 10 years is still with kind of, inflation with inflation is yeah like isn't it so it's just yeah. uh, and the other one is that there's a big pension dispute going on for some universities mine one isn't affected in that but it's a union so one out all out is that the pension provider that they were paying into slashed their pension by a third and didn't have to, which is really shit if you've been paying in a ton of money and then they turn around and say, you know, yeah, you can only have two thirds of that now. So yeah, oh so there's a whole goodness. bunch of reasons, that and workload and it's all just, I mean, everything like this, education, health service, it's probably the same in America, they run on goodwill and free labour, really, yeah. because the work wouldn't get done if teachers didn't work late into the evenings and over weekends and yeah over holidays no yeah. it's true I have a few friends who are like even elementary school teachers yeah. and the amount they work I'm like oh it's girl same. Jesus it's, it's absolutely demented and if it wasn't for people that effectively putting in free labor it wouldn't happen so it's kind of it's kind of good that everybody's coming together to go actually this is shit yeah we don't want to do this so that's what we're striking about at the moment and hopefully it'll be resolved yeah hopefully but, you know, sometimes it's just good to come together and go, fuck off. I think, I think we're at like a pinnacle time in yeah. in civilization where right. things that we did before aren't working right now. They're not working, right? Yeah. And, and, like the cost of living crisis. And I think as post-COVID, so it's interesting exactly. it from a historical point of view, because whenever you've had a major global disaster, especially illness, it happened after the Black Death, after the plague, is there's a revolt of the working classes immediately after the black death there was a peasants revolt because uh -huh. people people work through it people reassess how they're valued through it which is what's happened uh, it happened in the black death because it killed everybody and then suddenly peasants were much more in demand and valuable and could ask for more money than they ever had before not quite the case of covid although millions of people died but it's more that it made people reassess who the real essential workers are exactly yeah, you know. no, and I saw that 100%. And right. we're just like creeping out of that now. And, and people are going, is... yeah. And people are just like, actually, no, we need more money for this work. Uh, yes. That. So I think that it's very, so I'm very pleased to be part of it. Um, yeah. Sometimes I wish we were more like France when, when they're unionized because they really are. They do, I mean, say what you will about the French, but they do not put up with any crap. Mm -hmm. It was a couple of years ago and the French ballet union went out on strike and I can't even remember what they were out on strike on but loads of other unions came out with them and that's what we need of just just people going what are the ballet dancers out about no no don't care we're out as well and I love that solidarity yeah yeah I mean like I'm in Canada it's a little bit different than the U.S. but it's mm. still like it's comes with its challenges you're and... like a much softer version of the the U.S. you're yeah. like a nicer a nicer <laughs> non-demented version Actually, no because U.S. people are lovely Yes. They are, but 
think that all of us actually, I say this actually being in the UK, I'm well aware of Americans looking at us going, what the shit are you doing? Mm-hmm. And we're looking right back going, what the fuck's going on? It's exactly. Anyway, yes. It's just back crap crazy across the board, isn't it? So the revolution is on. It, it certainly feels that <laughs> way. <laughs> like, not going to lie. And then we have these little Gen Zers coming up and they're just changing the game. Oh, they are, aren't they? Like yeah. you can see the narrative shifting so fast. Yeah. Um, and especially in their attitude to work. Yes. Which is, it's a really interesting, I know there's loads of people going, oh, no, they don't want to work. Yeah, they do. Yes, they do. They just don't want to be ripped off and exploited. That's, yeah. and it's finally, yeah. we're actually stopping and saying that. Like one of the reasons that the lecturers are on strike is for something called casual contracts, which is, rife in uk universities in fact if you've been at a uk university you'll have been taught by someone on a um, a casual temporary contract i was on them for years and it means that you're employed to teach one module for 10 weeks and that's it so you don't know if you've got any employment after that you don't know if you're going to be able to come back the next year you can only plan for those 10 weeks and then you have no income over the summer no income over christmas no income over easter and there's no guarantee that you have no workers' rights and there's no guarantee that you'll be able to come back either. And I, when I was out on the picket line, the best thing about being on strike really is stood around talking to other people. And we were swapping stories of the stupid shit we were doing when we were on these precarious contracts in this ridiculous idea that if we just work harder than everyone else, we'll get rewarded and that they'll give us the proper job. At one point, I was sleeping in a car. Oh, my god! Because, because I was teaching over in Liverpool, which is couple of hours away from where I am now in Yorkshire and I had a late evening class and one at 9 a.m the next day and I thought to myself it's probably easier if I just sleep in the car in the car park and looking back now I'm just like what the that's insane that is insane behavior and I can't believe that I got so caught up with this bullshit that I thought that was acceptable and I really like the fact that Gen Z are coming through now they wouldn't do that they wouldn't stand for that they would (laughs) it's not a fucking open hell I like read an article about Gen Z and they said if the wage isn't in the job posting, they're not applying like because because they want to know that there's not a pay gap, you know, and they think it's really like I'm not going to go through all that work to get hired for minimum wage. Sorry, that's that's exactly like when they, they point things out like that, that should have been the way. A whole time. Why aren't wages posted? That's bullshit. I agree. Yeah. Well done, Gen Z. I yeah. mean, sometimes I sometimes I do look at them, and then I have to look around at the other elder millennials and Gen X, and just be like, it's we me. might have got we might have got a bit carried away with this whole, you know, your voice is important, and you can and you need to speak your truth because they are very noisy. This lot coming through. Oh, at yeah. the moment, yes, <laughs> we might have got a bit carried away. Yes, <laughs> with empowering them. <laughs> I guess we'll see, right? We'll see. <laughs> I like I like the fact that they're they're just kind of looking at everything that we have been doing and just going, no, nah, I'm not really feeling that. <laughs> just which is driving people insane. But I love that about them. And even TikTok. when it comes to like sex, like yes. I went to a show a few years ago and I saw like this group of younger people and they're like watching this DJ and all kind of making out with each other. And I'm like. I was not doing that no. you know, when I was in my late teens, early 20s. I didn't think I wouldn't go out in public and do that. That's for sure. No. So um, it's just fascinating to me. And you can I can see it. I can see it already in the generations of students that are coming through. And it's not even that long ago that things were things were different. But the way they categorize sexuality is vastly different. Now, they don't, a lot of times they don't put labels on things. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, I I remember distinctly, it's like, right, you're gay or you're straight or you're bisexual. And that's kind of it. There's no, there's nothing else. And then all these other labels started to come out of, you know, pansexual and flexi sexual and try all this stuff, which was great. And then the new generation coming through are just very much like, nah, I just kind of, I am what I am. I don't like to put a label on it. And that's interesting to see. Do you think like that's, going back in time to any certain I think that mm, I think that the labels were very important in the fight for equality because you have to name something in order to fight for it so I think that the the having the labels of I'm straight and I'm gay and I'm bisexual and then there's other labels coming through have been very important in the fight for equality I think that as sexuality in all its variations becomes 
just the norm, the need to define it will fall away slightly, I think. And you can see it in Gen Z already. Like, remember when Rebel Wilson was outed by that really shitty Australian, Australian newspaper? Yeah. Um, I was explaining it to, to my students and we were talking about it and they were genuinely perplexed as to why that would be a blackmailing issue, why that would be a story in the press. They couldn't understand why she would have to out herself because someone would write a story why would they write a story about it to them it was like saying you know someone's heterosexual it meant nothing to them and that was quite cool that was a moment of like oh okay i see you gen z nice so yeah i like that about them yeah did we ask you already what your current favorite fun fact from sex worker history is Oh, ooh, good one, Sylvie. There's a question. Um, I just whenever anyone asks me a really direct question like that, my entire brain freezes, <laughs> and it's like I can't remember anything that's happened up to this second in the un the history of the universe ever. Um, so my favorite fact about oh, my favorite fact from sex worker history is that on the site of Buckingham Palace there used to be an all male brothel. What? Wow. That's, that's... <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's written about um in I think it's about the 17th century, and it's referred to as a spintery, which was um just a slang word for it for an all-male brothel. And it was on the site where Buckingham Palace is. The two aren't related, I should point that out in case HRH <laughs> thinks I'm implying <laughs> that any member of the royal family would be caught out in a sex scandal. I was surely not. not. <laughs> surely not, it's Prince Andrew. <laughs> um, but oh. it brings it brings a whole new meaning to changing of the guards, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that that's one of my favourite facts from sex worker history. Possibly, as well, I really like the fact that the blues and jazz of America were formed in the the brothels of New Orleans in the Storyville district. I talked to a blues historian about that recently, Lamont yeah. Hill. Uh, Jackson uh, and he was explaining that how when the black musicians wanted to play their music the only venues they were allowed to play in were the brothels of the Storyville which was the red light district in New Orleans they weren't allowed in upmarket or um, decent places so in lots of ways the brothels played their their part in the American art form of blues and jazz which is pretty incredible I love that fact wow that is so cool yeah. I didn't know that yeah. either yeah, very cool. Yeah. Storyville for a long time. They they did what a lot of cities do all throughout history when they're thinking about how do we cope with all these people who want to sell and buy sex? What do we do? Um, and eventually someone will come up with the idea of zoning, which people do. So well, you can do it, but you could only do it in this area uh, under these conditions in, in that time. And the Storyville district, which was named after the guy who wrote up the draft for it, whose first name I can't remember, but his last name was Storyville. I don't think he thought that they would name the area after him. That must, must have been quite a moment of no, 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 don't, don't call it that, don't call it that. But it became known as Storyville, and it was the 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 pleasure district. It had its own thriving economy and guidebooks to the areas and uh, music and yeah, quite a wild a wild place. Is it wow. still called that district now? It's not called that now. It was disbanded after, um, I think it was just after the Second World War or huh. just before the Second World War. Um, again, speaking of world disasters that change things, mm -hmm. it changed, um, certainly changed how people view sex workers in America. So what happened in the Second World War, I'll go back a bit, what happened in the First World War was that venereal disease took out so many serving soldiers along the Western Front on both sides, on all sides. And the treatment for venereal disease was not a course of penicillin as it is now. It was two weeks in the sick bay and having daily, this isn't nice, so just brace yourself, having daily bladder injections of disinfectant. So it would be pushed oh. the bladder through the penis, down the penis shaft, and having the genitals scrubbed with a wire brush and carbolic soap, which was designed to be humiliating and designed to be painful to try and deter repeat offenders. So that was the that was the treatment, um, which is oh, fucking horrible enough. But the amount of man hours that are lost if your soldiers are contracting VD and they need two weeks off, was colossal. So in the First World War, um, 
Germany dealt with this by doing becoming uber efficient, super efficient. So they they gave their soldiers lectures in sexual health and they issued all the soldiers with condoms. And, and in occupying towns, they took over the brothels and instilled that Teutonic discipline of like, right, well, now we're in charge of everything and forced all the women to have venereal examinations and um, monitored who was allowed to go in and who had gone in. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, whereas other countries like Britain and particularly America, particularly America, adopted the approach of we'll just tell them not to do it yeah. <laughs> mm. and that always was... works so well <laughs> and it, it was just a disaster especially in the states they just wouldn't the authorities just wouldn't deal with this issue they just kept punishing and punishing and punishing and punishing anyone who was caught transgressing um so by the time the second world war rolled around everybody had a much better idea of like we need to get on this and we need to get it on it now so America and Britain educated their troops. They gave their, their troops prophylactic kits, um, condoms, gave them education and training and blamed women extensively, blamed women, horrendously blamed women. There were posters put up everywhere about showing women saying that she's a bag of trouble or uh, she might look clean, but VD um, yeah. is there, blah, 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 really nasty stuff. And one of the things that the laws that they passed in America was actually they could detain any woman suspected of selling sex and send her to uh, basically like a home for fallen women where she was kept until the end of the war. It's a really under-researched part of history, but in America, that was a law that was passed. So mm -hmm. during these wars, attitudes to women and women who sold sex changed radically because they then became vectors of disease and a threat to national security. And in some places like France, after the war had ended, because the Germans, again, took over all the brothels, they took over all the French brothels. Many of the women who worked in them were accused of being Nazi collaborators after the war. They weren't. They were just paid by Nazi soldiers. But as punishment for that, they were taken out into the streets and their heads were publicly shorn and they were um, sometimes tarred and feathered. And they, they were known as the shorn women. And you can see footage of this online it's really really nasty but they were publicly shamed and it was shortly after that that france closed down their system of legalized brothels as well so the second world war really changed how people viewed women and sex and sex work yeah it's a grim history wow. but it's grim. Yeah, that is did you know that there was a brothel in auschwitz no no, no. yeah 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 in, in one again it's a very very under-researched part of the history of the Holocaust. But in order to reward non-Jewish prisoners, Heinrich Himmler instituted brothels in several of the Nazi concentration camps, not just Auschwitz. Um, and that was to try and encourage non-Jewish prisoners to behave better. So your uh, prisoners, uh, your political prisoners or Jehovah's Witnesses, prisoners like that, prison, part of the resistance. And so little is known about the women that worked there. Because obviously it was deeply shameful for them. They all have been forced. Sex workers themselves were rounded up and held in concentration camps as antisocials. They'd have to wear a black star on their uniform. So maybe these women had been selling sex already and they were rounded up. It's very unlikely that they would have been Jewish. So we just don't, It's we know so little about them, about who they were. But it's a really bizarre fact, wow. isn't it? This It just seems so, I mean, of all, obviously nothing that happened at Auschwitz made any sense but it's just that piece of history is always it's just so troubling and I really wish that we knew more about who these people were mm -hmm. how they'd got there what happened you know I don't know yeah mm -hmm. a really troubling uh, well the whole thing was wasn't it but yeah wow that mm. that's astounding to me I mean as a as a Jewish person who's Great grandmother was gassed to death at Auschwitz. Oh my like, god, I didn't. Oh wow, that's, that, Well, that's a piece of information that I'm going to be thinking about for quite a while now. But obviously, you know, she was she was Jewish, so yeah, we mm. like yeah that that's absolutely fascinating. Isn't thanks it? For, thanks for telling us about that. It's. I think that there has been a book written about it, but it's it's by a German scholar and it's in German, and I haven't seen a translation of it yet. There is some. There was a, an amazing six part documentary series called. Nazis and the Final Solution that was based on the book Auschwitz um, by Lawrence Rees and there's an interview with a prisoner who saw a sex worker in the brothels of Auschwitz and he said that you would just get a token and then you'd go and you'd get a certain allocated amount of time with this person 
And um, and he was asked directly if he felt sorry for this woman. And his response was no, because they were much better looked after than than all the other prisoners, which is it's a difficult thing for us to understand looking back. But I guess at the time, like that was probably relative. it was all relative, isn't it? It's like I think that that probably was one of the better options if you were inside looked after kept under health looked after in inverted commas but fed and man yeah a really mm. troubling dark history I don't have any easy answers and I wish I knew more about it yeah I mean I, I remember interviewing my grandmother about it when I was when I was a kid for a history project we you know videotaped her talking about about the history of the holocaust and she had a, a friend who, who was also sitting in our living room doing that interview and um, she she had also been in Auschwitz and I remember being blown away I was about 13 at the time and she'd said that she um, conceived her first child at Auschwitz Jeez, uh, with, wow. and I was like how and she was like do you really think that people didn't find a way to have sex at Auschwitz mm. and I was like what and yeah. she was like yeah she's like sex finds a way Sylvie and I was like I, I remember wow. at 13 thinking that's the most mind-blowing thing I've <laughs> ever heard yeah. an old lady say first of all and second of all wow and you know and and there were pregnancies at Auschwitz there were mm. births at Auschwitz there was you know among Jewish and, and non-Jewish prisoners I guess but you know just the logistics of how of how and the risks mm. and the but even in the depths of of that kind of despair and in you know facing facing death and everything else sex finds a way mm. which is kind of you know it's it's awful and also hopeful at the same time I think right I think people forget how big Auschwitz was. It was like a, a town. It was it was enormous. Yeah, and yeah. so it was like, oh, I say this knowing how awful it was, but it was a community of people. Yeah. And relationships yeah. did form. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes pleasure takes you out of the pain yeah, and, that and you're in. To, to escape, right? That, yeah. That moment, but still... Well, I've managed to bring this down quite considerably. I think I've taken a <laughs> commercial break. <laughs> yes. I need to pick this up. I need to think of a, a more a perkier sex fact from history. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if we have a little bit of time um, after the commercial break, we talk a lot on this podcast about non-monogamy. Mm. Uh, non-monogamy has obviously been around for a very long time. And we will ask you maybe as a historian, what do you find interesting about the history of non-monogamy as it's been seen through various stages of history? So that'll come up in just a minute. So, Kate, I would love to know more about the history of non-monogamy. Okay. Tell, tell us some cool facts or, you know, things that you find interesting about how non-monogamy has changed. Obviously, okay. I mean, it's been around since the Bible, but, you know, tell us a little bit about today. And you, we were just talking about Gen Z and how relationship status and everything is just a lot more fluid today and it seems mm. a lot more normal. Has that, you know, has that been the case ever before in history? Not really. Um, I mean... Yes and no. It's it would be wrong to say that that's never happened before. Um all throughout most of Western history, there there has been a kind of a complex idea of what monogamy is, because monogamy tends to mean that you are married to one person, but you could have lovers. Um or sometimes that you could have multiple wives. We see that, that's biblical. What we don't tend to see a lot of is what's called polygyny, which is where the women have more than one partner. This tends to mean so yeah, that all throughout history there's been this idea of you know you can have multiple partners, although they wouldn't recognize it like that. I mean, right up to the 19th century, and maybe even today, the idea that a man will have a wife but will have a mistress was completely normal accepted mm -hmm. expected but you'd have to do it on the quiet and be a bit respectful about it like to the point where it was weird if kings didn't have mistresses and lords it was completely expected but that doesn't mean that the woman was supposed to do it it doesn't so that's what's kind of different in our society that's what gen z are doing a little bit more differently is that women are now having multiple partners and they are okay with it um the really weird thing about monogamy from a scientist 
a scientific point of view, from a point of view of evolutionary biology, no one's quite sure why humans keep trying it. It's like a real <laughs> evolutionary conundrum. Like, honestly, there's been so many research papers and research projects into this of like, why do humans keep going back to this model of monogamy? When and, and there'll be many people listening to this that are in very happy monogamous relationships, and that's brilliant. You keep doing that. But as a species, if we're thinking just like from an evolutionary point of view that we're animals, it doesn't actually make that much sense. So occasionally you will hear someone saying that you know men are naturally hardwired to spread their seed and to have as many as much sex with many women as they want to. Blah, blah, blah. You hear that being tried out, and I guess that's true. But what's often overlooked is it also makes sense for women to have as much sex as possible with as many different partners. Because if you want to increase your chances of getting pregnant, you want to have as much sex as you possibly can with as many different competing types of sperm as you can. And you want to diversify your offspring with as ma- much different genetic variability as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. So it's not true that it's only men that's supposed to be doing that. So the question then is, then why do humans keep going back to this monogamy thing? And that is our dominant model, by the way, monogamy, or at least monogamy one at a time. We tend to do that we pair bond with somebody and then we go, I like you, you like me. It just does, yeah, hurrah. And then then if we go our separate ways, we'll do that again with somebody else. That tends to be what we do. And actually that is the most typical type of um, relationship dynamic in the animal kingdom. Genuine monogamy, that properly, proper monogamy where you meet and stay exclusively with the first person that you've met is incredibly rare. There's yeah. only about five species in the animal kingdom that have been seen to do it. Very And lobsters aren't one of them, despite what friends <laughs> No, lobsters are actually quite slutty. There's, um, <laughs> slutty lobsters. Slutty lobsters. Don't listen to what friends say. <laughs> but there's a lot of research about why do humans go back to this when it would be genetically better for us to be all be having loads of sex with each other. And the answer is probably a sociological one that... Um, I'm single and I love living by myself, but fucking hell, it's expensive. Bloody hell, it is expensive because you have to do everything by yourself. You have to buy everything on your own. And also you have to do everything for yourself. It's like the one crappy bit. It's like if you had a bad day or you're feeling a bit poorly, there's no one there to go, oh, you bring me a sandwich. Nobody. Yes. So that, right? And I love being single. And if there was a man sat on the sofa going, do you want a sandwich? Do you want to have a sandwich? Eventually I'd be like, well, just go away. I want to be on my own 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 space. But that is probably part of the evolutionary of it, is that we are better when we team up in terms of resources and um, we are better when it comes to sharing things, um, especially in times when things are scarce. You know, like it's a zombie apocalypse film. You've got to find a crew to to survive. Mm -hmm. That's one of the the theories about it. And then there's all other kind of theories about um, finding... If you've got one person... If you're in a relationship with one person and human beings are scarce and you might not have a lot of sex, it's better to hang on to that one person <laughs> and guarantee sexual exclusivity rather than risking trying. You might not get it with somebody else. That, that's another theory. And then there's wilder theories of like um, the men have got to stick around because that helps rear the children and protect them from other competing males who might kill them. And it all gets a bit like that. But yeah, the the question of why do we do this is a really puzzling one. Hmm. yeah i mean have the people who've done that research ever met any dads <laughs> i feel like if they are <laughs> if they met the standard dad they'd be like oh no these guys are useless <laughs> <laughs> the people who do this research um are evolutionary biologists and scientists and it's really important research but when you read it fuck it that sounds so depressing like when you're just talking about human beings and like competing males and possible infanticide it all sounds so clinical and just doesn't capture the absolute messiness of the human experience exactly I mean, as sex educators we get it all the time like we get people who come to us with all like all, a lot of the fantasies that we get from people are you know multiple sex partners and yeah. Uh, and cuckolding cuckolding yep. is something i know that that you've written about historically as well tell us a little bit about the history of that i mean <laughs> is that the history of what like actual people cheating on each other or the fantasy the fantasy of, of it, it the of, fantasy of wanting that because and it's still very predominant especially in america where you know there's a lot of shame 
and people mm. get off on that shame i mean we constantly have republicans being brought before the news with like you know there was an there was one who was in charge of a university i think that was last year i think it was jerry falwell's son or someone who you know he he watched his wife having sex with the pool boy or something and wow. um and when it came out he was sort of like so what <laughs> like yes it happened but i'm so sorry and i'm not quitting my job and it was like oh that's interesting which is a, that's a new stance isn't it i quite like that stance as well i'm not sure yeah. what his politics are so he might be an absolute twat but he i kind of like i like he is well that's, not, <laughs> not, that, that's a whole other subject but i do like the fact that people might be starting to finally go look i have a kink it's not hurting anybody <laughs> piss off because right? I, I think that that the shame that we still attach to this stuff is profound and sex is a very, very powerful thing. It's very difficult not to look at when very important people, politicians and actors and very important other people get caught up in a sex scandal. <laughs> Just sat there looking at it and going, why the fuck would you do that, you silly sod? And like, was it worth it? You know, was it worth... That was the, Clearly, the sex was worth it. So it's it's that much of a primal motivator. But um, to cook holding... Whenever you're researching sex history, the thing that you have to deal with straight away is the lack of sources that you have. Because sex, as we've just been saying, is still associated with shame. It's often people do it in secret. They do it in private. They don't express these emotions, which I understand why. But it's very frustrating for us as historians. But So what you get is it's recorded a lot when you get literary pornography, which is around about the 18th century and into the Victorian period. And you can still read a lot of this erotica online. There's a Victorian erotic magazine called The Pearl, which ran from 1879 to 1880, which is just bonkers, even by today's standards. And that's a lot of um, wives being passed around and shared. And so it was obviously a thing, but finding it and tracing the history of it, especially where the women are concerned, is very difficult because the stigma and the punishment that they faced for having sex with somebody else was profound. Um, in the Middle Ages, there was something known as the whore's mark, which is where they'd cut your nose off and your ears off um, to punish adulterers, adulteresses, I should say. Um, and even when the divorce law was changed in 1856, I think it was, um, that only meant that women could get a divorce on grounds of aggravated adultery, whereas a husband could divorce a wife if he suspected she'd been adulterer, uh, she'd cheated on him. She could only divorce her husband if he cheated on her and he'd beaten her up as well. So oh, wow. it's, it's finding this history is a lot harder than, wow. than you'd think because the risks that people had to, for, for doing this, for engaging in this kind of behaviour were colossal. So they just didn't, so they hid it. So then you can't find it as a historian. But I'd, I'd put money on the fact that that cuckolding fantasy has always been with us, always. Yeah. Wow. Well, so, you know, Tara and I are sexological body workers, and we we believe, and our, our you know, school believes, that there is a relationship between sex and healing, pleasure mm -hmm. and healing. So do you have any fun historical anecdotes or stories you can tell us about sex workers offering healing services and... I know that a lot of the stuff about Victorian uh, medical doctors and vibrators has all been debunked uh, mm -hmm. and you talked about that in your book, but are there any other historical links between sex, pleasure and healing and people sort of trying to sell that as a, as a healing modality? The sacred horrors. There's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there, there, uh, there's them, but that is a very, very contentious issue of historical research as to whether or not so-called sacred prostitution was real and the reason again is because the sources that we have we just don't have a diary from someone who was working in ancient babylonia and was a temple whore we just don't have it what we've got are clay cune cuneiform tablets that people have tried to translate that have got fractions and fragments of legends on it. So um, we know that the Mesopotamian Babylonian goddess Ishtar was worshipped and that she was associated with selling sex. Um, there are stories of her selling sex for a shekel. And we know that she had priestesses and we know that she had a temple. But the debate comes in of like, but what did they do there? 
that does it like w- w- are we saying that these priestesses who worked um who worshipped Ishtar sold sex to uh, patrons of the church as a form of worship or are we saying that sex workers hung around the temples to pick up clients um it's much more complicated we just don't know the answer to it we know that um greek writers like herodotus wrote lengthy accounts of how women in babylonia um, were forced to sell sex outside the temples but he just talks shit most of the time there's no evidence that any of that actually happened um he might just be propaganda so it's a really contentious issue about did that happen the most obvious link that we have to that is the tradition of the devdasi in india who are servants of the goddess yelama and who do sell sex Uh, And they will want revered as great courtesans and artists. And they were, um, the sex was part of their world, but it was incidental. They would have patrons who who paid them and they would give the money to the temples. Um, But then when British colonialism expanded, they saw them only as quote unquote prostitutes. And so set about dismantling and making the Devdasi illegal. And they're still very stigmatized group who are outcast in india today but they are a living link to the fact that there were sex workers and religion and service of the gods were all intertwined Mm -hmm. i like to think that at some point in our history sex workers were sacred but i think that maybe says more about our own my, my especially my own attitudes today is it's a comforting thought that we like of like at some point we had it figured out and we weren't quite as fucked up as we are now. Maybe we can go back to that, but there isn't a lot of evidence for it. When it comes to sex as healing, there's lots of evidence for that, but it's kind of fucked up. It's not, it's not like what you guys do, which is sort of a much more gentle, holistic and, you know, and it's much more sex positive. This is much more like if you don't stop masturbating, you're going to go blind and I'm going to restrain you on a bed. That's, it's much more than that kind of, like the idea that you could damage your body with sexual pleasure and you could damage yourself by giving into your baser desires. Um, the idea of sexual healing, that it's good for you, it's always been there. We can see it in the porn, but it's not until you get to about the 20th century that you get to start people actually talking or at least writing in mainstream books about what good sex is and why good sex is important and how you have good sex. That's still a way off what you guys are doing, where it's making a link between it being spiritually important and a healing model I can't think of any time in history that that's happened. I'm sure that it's there. There have been very close links between sex and health. But as I said, especially in the West, it's tended to be more of a stop doing that than yeah. please do more of that and let's talk about it. There wasn't so much of that. Isn't that how Kellogg's cereal got started, right? Oh, anti masturbation. Yes. yes, it was an anti masturbation device. That's an old belief that the type of food that you eat will stimulate you uh, in many ways but also sexually and if you have spicy foods it will inflame your passions and lust and the same with red meats and wine so if you wanted to get rid of these passions and these awful urges eat as much plain food as you possibly can and harvey kellogg was an absolute mental he was just bonkers and he was one of many victorians who believed that masturbation was incredibly dangerous and needed to be stopped at all costs all costs um because they believed that if you lost too much semen, so it's particularly aimed at men here, um, if you lost too much semen, that you'd become weak and feeble and go blind and die. That's what they yeah. thought. So <laughs> the humble cornflake was part of this movement to huh. stop people uh, want, having the urge at all. I did not know that. Yes, he probably really wanted to masturbate deep down. He was like, oh, he was, that's he's all he really... thought about. <laughs> he was he was married and he refused to have sex with his wife and he spent his honeymoon writing his manifesto about why you shouldn't masturbate and he was a very but he kept giving himself enemas so like <laughs> okay it's All just right. so like he was obsessed with this like don't have sex don't masturbate but I'm going to keep shoving things at my ass because these two things aren't related at all so no. it was it, wow. not someone yeah just a very odd and conflicted and damaged person i think not yeah. a fun dinner party guest no no 
No, it's but it just served you Kellogg's cornflakes, wouldn't it? Oh, shit. <laughs> Oh my oh. gosh! Who who would be your top um top dinner party guests from oh. sex history? Casanova. I yeah. want I want to know. I want to know. I don't know if he spoke English very well though. So we might have a bit of a language. <laughs> it <laughs> might be translate. like Google Translate. Okay, <laughs> yes. so was it Casanova? He, he could, well, actually Casanova. I could speak Italian because Italian sounds very sexy. Um, I'd like to know what all the fuss was about. Um, and I'd like to know if he really was as good as he as he thought he was. That would be interesting. Um, who else? Let's, I might I might invite Kellogg, you know, just to see how weird he actually is. Just to sit there and just be like, tell me, tell me your thoughts, you complete lunatic, you. <laughs> just to just to see what he was like, and probably Byron, just because I fancy oh, yeah. Byron quite a lot. Yeah. It's just that sort of irresistible bad boy spell tortured artist. I can save you. No, you can't. He's an idiot. He's a complete dick. But just yeah, I probably. Spell. Just yeah, <laughs> I think I probably have Byron, and then I'd end up shagging Byron, and then he'd end up ghosting me, and I'd feel really sad. Like, no, oh, he's a dick. Yeah, of course he is. So you've you've just got yourself a fuck marry kill triangle there. You've got I have your I? fucking Casanova <laughs> marrying <laughs> Byron and killing Kellogg. <laughs> Oh, just no, I might, I might kill Byron. By all accounts, he was a bit of a twat. Yeah, but, but a bad one. A fun one. A fun like a, twat. Like an emo, an emo tortured yes. soul. But you've got to think like a very spoilt, rich emo tortured soul um, who would go off to India to find himself for a year. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's like everyone has an ex-boyfriend like that right absolutely absolutely <laughs> but but very very good poetry and, and i'm being very facetious but yeah they would be interesting people to meet i think and also, actually i'd probably meet the people that aren't very illustrious because they're the ones we never ever ever get to hear from and exactly. they're the ones that could answer so many questions for us i would like pick me any sex worker from the 18th century 17th century at random at will and just let me ask them questions. Like, so many questions. Like, we know what Byron was getting up to vaguely and all the rest of it, but what normal, regular, everyday people, what their experience of sex was, we just, we know so little about yeah. it because they're not the ones that left us records. So, yeah, we'll say that. Just any random person, I just want to sit down and just ask them questions. Have you, have you spoken to any, like, 80, 90-year-old former sex workers um, I I did. I two of the most interesting people I spoke to. I did, gave a talk about the history of sex work in Leeds, where I'm based, and um, and I managed to trace it back to the 18th century. And then um, there was records of like the 1950s and where the brothels were. And there was a really elderly gentleman in the audience who came up afterwards and said that he was a police officer in the 50s and that he knew all of these women and all these people. And that and I was just thinking, God, wow, it's like a living history that if we don't capture it, it just dies with people, and we don't. We don't know. There um, are some amazing historians who are doing oral history projects with um, elder older people to try and capture what they remember about sex that that's mm -hmm. ongoing at the moment. And and yeah, and it's so important that we do because when this history dies, it dies with with us, and then we just don't have the answers. Oh, so much. What? Tell us. Are you working on another book right now? I'm so waiting for a sequel to the Curious History of Sex that's um it's in it's in the works it's um yeah it's we're just discussing contracts and bits and pieces and and money show me the money that's right. <laughs> um but also it's it is it's a huge piece of research that the, the first book was like the foot footnotes alone run to over ten thousand words oh. and and i really wanted and I always, it's so important to do that because, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and I want people to be able to follow up what I've uh, I've looked at. And also because I've got something wrong, I want someone to be they said so, they said so, it wasn't me, I did they said that. Um, but it, it is a colossal, huge piece of research. So it's also about having the time to do it and finding the time to do it. But I've got it all in my head and I know that I want to write it. I've even got the title, um, Curious History of Sex 2, The Second Coming. Oh, Ooh. I love it. Hey, that's great, isn't it? That just writes itself. Love I was it. toying with the idea of sloppy seconds for a while, but then <laughs> um, a friend's like, it's funny, it's funny, but it does convey the idea of something that's left over that's not very nice. 
So I was like, yeah, that's so we're, we're going to go for the second coming. No, I love it. Yeah, I there's loads wait. that I put in the book that that I that I left out. There's so much stuff, and like now that the book's been out there for a couple of years, people I get feedback from people all the time. Like you know, someone was like, it needs more lesbians. I'm looking at it going, yeah, it we does always need, need more lesbians. We always need that's more lesbians. right. So like I always just like think to myself, I yeah, they're right. I should do that. And you know, when you read some of the the reviews, even the nasty ones, you pick things up like, yeah, actually, why didn't I? say that so now I feel that yeah I've got loads I could say watch wow. this space <laughs> we we could we could talk to you for hours but we, I know obviously I know. we we know that you you have places to go and things to do and books to write books um, to write get on with it Kate I'll be like Rihanna everyone will just be going where's the where's the album I know I won't, I won't have her money <laughs> <laughs> just have you at the next Super Bowl with just like with your with you your even book. imagine I'll just I wouldn't announce I'm pregnant it'd just be my big fat belly because I've eaten too many <laughs> sausage rolls <laughs> that's beautiful everybody is beautiful even sausage rolls oh bless you <laughs> sorry did we want to do any instagram questions do we have an instagram question okay hit me when in history did it start to be bad to be non-monogamous oh. <laughs> that is very 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 tricky because it's not it's it's subject to context, it's subject to class, it's subject to country, it's subject to culture. It's there wasn't like a it happened on a Tuesday morning at 2 p.m. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but there was a shift in the early medieval teachings of the church that st- when about around the time that they started saying priests shouldn't have sex, and all the priests went, What? What? didn't sign up for this and it was they were really pissed off as you would be but they started to change what it meant to be married and that this idea that it was a holy sacrament between one man and one woman and there was a slight shift there of like you only have one husband and wife that doesn't mean that men didn't take multiple mistresses they did but there was the church changed from um as you read in the bible like king solomon has i can't even remember how many wives loads of wives i mean remembering birthdays must have been an absolute nightmare but <laughs> he had so many wives and then and then kind of then you get to the medieval period and that's shifted and we just kind of don't talk about that anymore we don't talk about that bit so that wasn't held up as a model um i suppose it starts to change a bit as well by the time you get to the 19th century because start things start to clamp down in sexually moral ways do you ever notice that like each time period rebels against the the era that came before because it's trying to define itself against that the victorians have a reputation for being sexually prudish and that was part of them but they were also absolute filth bags who invented porn but one of the things that they didn't pitch upon i should say photographic porn one of the things that they did is they tried to define themselves against the 18th century, which had been known as a time of fun, basically, of, you know, that's your Bridgerton, that's your um, mm-hmm. heaving bodices and um, your Georgian period and all that stuff. And the 19th century became a time of we are going to behave ourselves. We're going to behave ourselves. So sexual mores were clamped down on quite a lot in the 19th century. So it wasn't as permissible for a man to have multiple mistresses. They still did. They just had to be a bit quieter about it. So there's not a definitive moment. Our attitudes to monogamy are infinitely complex, very complex. It's just fascinating that we have this idea of like what just one person, that's it. But we seem so shit at it. Like it's clearly not like if it was... Then if that's what we're supposed to do, then why aren't we doing it? Like, why are we so hopeless at it? Maybe that's just very cynical of me. But yeah, we've had a very, very complex relationship with with monogamy. Yeah, I mean, Tara and I are not fans, so <laughs> of it in general. Yeah. But yeah. we're not really monogamous. So we're monogamous one at a time. At least that's what we try to do. Yeah, that's what we try and try and do. I I don't know. I've been with my partner for nearly ten years, and we've had many partners we've had girlfriends and other couples and I mean it, it it's enhanced our relationship to a level mm. that just the two of us wouldn't be able to sustain and we have lots of hot memories together and that's, I mean, that's exciting and that's that's 
that's amazing that, that I think one of the things that people underestimate about non-monogamy is how much work it is they think that it's just gonna be like this non-stop <laughs> sexual <laughs> orgy it's like imagine how difficult one relationship is it's but now you have to do that three or four times it's yeah. very very complicated but I think that you're right that we've created a system where you are looking to one one humble simple human being to fulfill every single one of your needs your emotional needs intellectual needs sexual needs financial needs and it's Sandwich needs. Sandwich, sandwich needs it's sandwich true. needs it's true and um yeah and and i think that's an awful lot of pressure but i will also caveat that by saying I, I know that people um have one partner and are deliriously happy with them and love them to pieces and couldn't imagine it any other way and the absolute best of luck to you couldn't be happier for you but yeah i like the fact that alternative alternatives to that are becoming more and more acceptable mainstream Mm -hmm. i would have to agree even in the 10 years that we've been exploring this in our relationship it's shift right it's shifted big time yeah Yeah. i was recently asked to write an an article on thruples because they've been in the press a little bit and it was kind of interesting of just like it's not really a story anymore it's not like i remember like even a few years ago it had been like oh my god non-monogamy let's talk to the non-monogamous people Oh my god hello you what's it like being non-monog- and it's kind of been done now it's played out it's like yeah they're there yeah they're just doing the thing it's like you have to have a new hook in it now to get a story out of it because it's not news now that people are living their lifestyles like this no one can cool. afford housing of course people are living their lives like this <laughs> it's like, so it true more sense. oh that makes perfect sense to me actually yeah mm-hmm. anyway kate um, tell us um, where people can find you. Do you want Ooh. people to find you? Maybe you don't want I people, want to, people find you. to find me. Um, but... I want nice people to find me. That would be that would be lovely. Um, I have had to turn off my DMs on social media because people kept sending me pictures of their penises. Oh, which I like, know. I, pre- I appreciate that. Like I tweet a lot of pictures of penises, but it's like it really it's not a game. I don't need you to send them back to me. That's fine. So. <laughs> So oh, I've had no. to stop doing that. But you can find me on um, Twitter as at Hors of Your, or my human account is at K8 underscore Lister. And that's also where you can find me on TikTok. And I think Instagram is Dr. Kate Lister. I think I was feeling fancy that day. Um, and obviously, <laughs> I've got my own little podcast, Betwixt the Sheets, which you can find in all places that you find podcasts amazing i love that podcast as well good fun i really enjoy it (laughs) well thank you so much and thank you also to our amazing listeners uh for tuning into the sex ed for the modern bed show tara tell us how to connect with us uh probably the easiest way is on instagram you can just look up our show instagram it is the.sexed.show and we have links to our instagrams and everything fun on there it's probably the easiest way and thank you so much for joining us today this has been oh, so exciting like i've learned pleasure. so much my brain feels like it's like this much bigger <laughs> so <laughs> oh, I, was, I was so much fun talking to you thank you for inviting me on this is brilliant and um yeah thank you until next time claim your pleasure own your body and stay in presence